And now we are going to hear about mapping this word that is I've never heard of before. Um, so bear with me. Evapotranspiration. I missed a syllable, didn't I? Um, and Tony Morris, right? who's the manager of the geospatial technology section in Idaho, and William Kramer, who is the senior remote sensing analyst. Uh, we did hear about it this morning. It sounded fascinating. <laughs> Madam Chair, members of the committee, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of my collaborators, Bill Cramber and Rick Allen, good afternoon. My name is Tony Morse, and I want to tell you the most important thing you can know about water in the western United States. There is not enough of it. Mark Twain observed that whiskey is for drinking, water is for fighting over. <laughs> this is as true today as it was in the 19th century. In Idaho, groundwater irrigators are fighting with surface water irrigators. In California, farmers are fighting with cities over an inadequate water supply. Colorado is fighting with Kansas and Nebraska over irrigation water. Wyoming is fighting with Montana and everybody is afraid of a thirsty Las Vegas. Our project was born of that kind of conflict in Idaho. We needed a better way to map water use for water right negotiations among Idaho, Utah, and Wyoming. Evapotranspiration, or water use, is water that's evaporated from soil or transpired by growing vegetation. Our project focuses on evapotranspiration from irrigated agriculture because nothing else that people do uses nearly as much water. In Idaho, evapotranspiration from irrigated agriculture amounts to more than 90% of total water use. Our project is innovative because it is a whole new approach to computing and mapping evapotranspiration. For the first time, we can map water use on a field-by-field -field basis, which is how water is actually managed, rather than on a county-wide basis, which is how we have had to do it in the past. Our project is innovative because we do this using Landsat, a satellite orbiting 450 miles in space, we do it 10,000 square miles at a time, and we do it more accurately than it has been done by previous methods. In Idaho, we found very quickly that our project had uses beyond our original vision. Our planners use evapotranspiration data to help understand how water use will change as land use changes with population growth and they use evapotranspiration data to help strike a balance between irrigating crops and protecting the habitat of salmon and steelhead. Our lawyers use evapotranspiration data to help defend administrative decisions about water rights. Our director uses evapotranspiration data as the basis for requiring groundwater irrigators to compensate surface water irrigators during times of drought. We have been so successful that 11 other states are using or evaluating our methods as a solution to their water conflicts. And the Western States Water Council is actively lobbying Congress in support of the Landsat program. We rely on publicly available non-proprietary Landsat data. This means three things. That the data for all parties to a conflict are consistently processed and equally available to all. That we can analyze how water is used at the same level that water is managed. And that because Landsat has a 25-year archive of data, we can show patterns of water use through time. More conflicts over water are inevitable with a growing population and a changing climate. Our innovation is a significant tool that can be used by individuals, by the private sector, by state governments, 
and by the federal government as the basis for negotiating solutions to avoid fighting with litigation. Our innovation is not the last word in solving water conflicts, but it is a significant step forward. Thank you. Thank you. Well said. And do we have any questions? Yes, Bill. Oh, the, I think the, the question that occurred to me is, of course, the problem of the longevity of, the, of Landsat. I mean, it's going to, uh, it's in a perilous state, shall we say, at the moment, so that if that data, that imaging wasn't available, it would be pretty hard to replicate your program, wouldn't it? Bill, do you want to take that? Sure, I'll take that. Um, <laughs> well, a couple of years ago, it looked very likely that the next Landsat would not have a thermal band, so we wouldn't be able to continue this program. But by people seeing how well this data has worked for Idaho and other states implementing uh, similar things to our program, there's been an effort in, with, even within NASA to include a thermal sensor on the next Landsat. And now it looks a lot more likely that the next Landsat will include a thermal band. But we do have a contingency plan just in case it doesn't, which is to use a vegetation index-based ET approach. And a vegetation index like NDVI, which is used as part of metric, shows the relative amounts of vegetation through the season. And by using a relationship between that and existing metric ET data, Dr. Allen is developing a contingency model that we would use in place of metric if a thermal band is not on the next Landsat. And why, can I just ask, why wouldn't they, uh, they use it? Um, I suppose it must be money or something like that. It was money, yes. <laughs> they wanted to save money. And, can, and I'm just curious, given its use, how much does it cost? The, I think it's a, you know, given the vast importance of it, I can't imagine it could be too expensive. I, I'm sorry, I, did, I didn't hear that. The, the, but how I much said money? Given, the vast, given the vast impact of this issue, I can't imagine how adding this to the satellite would be too expensive. It's not like putting air conditioner on your car when you buy it or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, do, do any of you uh, have friends in Congress? <laughs> How much are we talking if, about? <laughs> if so, if so may I talk with you after the meeting? So that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> it, it, has been, it has been difficult to get traction on this. That's not a, that's not a lot of money. Yeah, I'm sure. Anyway, it's $100 million a year? No, no, no. That's the total cost. For, For adding it to one satellite. And how many satellites do you need to add it to? You know, we, we would love to have three. I mean, this is normally not the kind of questions we ask, but it's just sort of. But we're kind of struck by the yeah. <laughs> impending to. Yes, we're, we're struck by this question as well. Um, and we've been doing our best to convince uh, members of Congress that this is money well spent. But <clears throat> given everything else that's going on, plus the transition between administrations, plus the fact that a decision had already been made, no, it's very difficult to get a decision reversed. And taken in total, yeah, it has been a challenge. So it's not a line item in, in the budget? David, the yeah, and then Maria. <laughs> no, it's not a line item in, in the budget, although <coughs> the uh, Landsat Authorization Act of 2008 specifically um, instructs the administrator of NASA to plan for a thermal band on the next Landsat satellite. Okay. Um, David, if Maria, you don't then, get it, how much do you lose with this alternative method? <clears throat> Probably about 10% in accuracy going to the... So you get 90% of what you got now? Pardon me? So you get 90% of what you have now? Close to 90%, yes. But the fights must be over that 10%, right? It's going to be. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I well, mean yes. I'm giving you something. I might be wrong, but I would think that when you're talking about water, 10% matters. Well, the director would like to have the most accurate information possible. Otherwise, you're going to have these fights. It's going to even be more difficult fights. So my question goes to, you mentioned that there are other states. If, how... How confident are you that this technology and the information you've derived and the, the enviro, can't even say it, evapotranspirate, 
shun. You, will we <laughs> try that one? You can say ET if you want. <laughs> ET. <laughs> um, will is really has some uh, buy-in from other consumers of this who would want this kind of information. Some well, other states are already using it. I, I, I don't know how to answer that except to say that <clears throat> other states are, in fact, using this uh, to solve their own problems. If they felt this were not a viable technology, they would not invest time and effort in it. Okay. Well, th does anybody have another question? Ed? Yes. Uh, real quick one. Is can this technology be used to provide advice to individual farmers about how to more efficiently use water? Uh, yes, it can, and there have been some studies done in the Imperial Valley in California <clears throat> about the difference between um, the differences in salt buildup and the effect on uh, vegetation between one end of a field and another end of a field, if that makes any sense. And let me add to that, we have this data available on a web mapping service where individuals can go on the web and look at their farms and fields and see the actual ET data and compare it from one field to another. Okay, the, the okay. political side of that question has to do with the interest that the very powerful agricultural extension service folks would have in what you're doing? I don't think they're aware of it yet. Yeah. Okay. Well, we see what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just a very, very quick question. Is there a scheduled date for the new, the next launch of the Landsat, next Landsat satellite? Uh, yes. <clears throat> it's now scheduled for December of 2012. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting uh, presentation. So, uh, really, be a really quiz next period. <laughs>